All right, you're very welcome along to another OTB Sports interview. Um, my guest today is a very special one, Jerry Schemmel. Uh, Jerry's a sports broadcaster based in Colorado over in the United States. He's been a play-by-play announcer for a number of uh, big sports organizations in Colorado, the Denver Nuggets in the NBA, the Colorado Rockies as well in Major League Baseball. Uh, and aside from, from that, Jerry's had a, an extraordinary interesting life that uh, I guess a lot of people focus on, on the events of, of one particular day. So July 19th, of 1989, so almost 31 years ago now, Jerry was a passenger on board United Airlines Flight 232, which was on a scheduled flight from Denver to Chicago uh, that made a crash landing in Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, That crash led to the deaths of 112 people on board. Uh, Over 180 people survived that crash. 184 people survived. Jerry was one of those. Um, But Jerry, first of all, thanks a lot for taking the time out to, uh, to have a chat with us today. You're very welcome. Good to be here with you, Shane. I know that that day, July 19th, 1989, is something I'm sure you're sick of speaking about at this point. It's something that, that's constantly um, brought up to you and something that you constantly have to talk about. But what are your memories of, of that day? And, and, and I guess the build up to it, you, you were working uh, with the Continental Basketball Association. And, and, and what, what had you on that flight that day? Yeah. Well, first of all, no, I, I, I never get tired of talking about it. I think that's one of the reasons I survived, Shane, is that I can tell the story now and, and maybe have some positive impact on somebody. So it's never a, a problem or a chore for me to go back and, and revisit the crash. And when you said 31 years ago, I can't believe it's been that long, man, that's gone, that's gone by really fast. But, you know, it was, it was a crazy day because I wasn't supposed to be on that plane originally. I was supposed to fly at seven o'clock in the morning, as you said, a flight from Denver to Chicago and got out the airport about six o'clock in the morning or so and found out that my flight was canceled. And so I got rebooked on four consecutive flights. They were all full, so I'm flying standby, and finally got on the fourth standby flight, which turned out to be, as you mentioned, United Airlines Flight 232. So I wasn't supposed to be on that plane. I had a chance to, to go on an earlier flight. My travel companion, who was my boss at the time with the CBA, uh, said, no, let's travel together. So we ended up being delayed by six hours, and really we're not supposed to be on this airplane. We, we got the last two seats aboard United Flight 232. Uh, from from reading and, and listening to different passenger accounts of those who survived, um, I, I remember reading one of them who, who said that you know obviously the explosion happened and uh, th- the feeling in the cockpit was one of clear immediacy that people knew how serious this was. This wasn't just a regular a regular flight that day. So, what, what were your memories of that particular moment when the when engine two exploded? Yeah, pretty vivid, actually, Shane. And, and it was about, it's about a two-hour flight from Denver to Chicago. So we're about half of there. I think we're one hour in, or just short of that. And uh, out of nowhere came this explosion. And I could hear it first, and then I could feel it kind of come from the back of the plane to the front of the plane. You kind of feel the reverb uh, from the, the blast. And the first thing I thought was a bomb has gone off. I honestly did. I thought someone had planted it like a terrorist had planted a bomb. It had been detonated, and we started to drop. And this is crazy because I don't know if you remember Pan Am 103, it was down by a terrorist bomb over Scotland uh, about six months before our crash. And I thought, wow, the same thing has happened on American soil and this is crazy. And we started to drop and I thought, well, this is it for everybody. And sort of, I I don't know if you call it eerie or strange or something, but a couple of questions just popped in my mind as this is happening. Number one was, um, uh, how many people are aboard this plane? Uh, because I wanted to know how many people were going to die in the next couple moments we hit the ground. And the thought in my mind was 200 for some reason. I was almost 100 off. There were 296 of us. And then the question that hit my head was, how long does it take a DC-10 to drop uh, 28,000 feet or where we were, 37,000 feet? And I had no idea on that one. And so I was thinking, how long did it take before we hit the ground? And about the time I had those questions, we came out of that drop. uh, And after probably about a minute or two, we felt like we were flying normal again. We had kind of leveled off and, and it didn't seem completely normal. The sound of the engines were different, but we weren't dropping anymore. And, and some of the panic that had taken over the cabin kind of subsided just a little bit. I read somewhere that uh, the, the time limit from, uh, from, I guess, the explosion to when the crash landing occurred in Iowa it was something around 35, 40 minutes. I mean, did the pilots give any indication as to how serious this was going to be? 
They did. Yeah, actually, uh, the first exchange from the cockpit came from Captain Al Haynes, our, our cockpit captain. He said that uh, the explosion we heard was not a bomb going off, but the number two engine, he said, that sits in top in the back of the plane exploded. And he said when it did, it injured the rear of the aircraft. And he told us initially, his first exchange, he said, we're having a lot of trouble controlling this aircraft. And then he sort of signed off because there was so much craziness going on in the cockpit. They were trying to stabilize the plane and keep us from crashing and dropping and all that. And they finally did a little bit of that. He got back on the PA system a little while later and he said, all right, we've been given a directive to make an emergency landing in Sioux City, Iowa. He said, I want everybody in their seats. Uh, their seat belts are fastened. You can't get out of your seat under any circumstance. You can't get up and talk to people. He said, all right, uh, this is, this is going to be rough. This is going to be rougher than anything you've ever been through. You need to get ready for a crash landing because we're not going to land this plane and walk off this thing safely. So he knew, cockpit crew knew that we were in trouble, and he wanted us as passengers to understand that as well. And I think he did a, did a great job of doing that. Uh, you, you see in movies, um, and that's my only real reference for this, but uh, – before a plane crash happens or if passengers are aware that a flight is going down, you know, people react differently. Some people cry, some people pray, some people hold hands, some people, I guess, write letters or notes to their loved ones if they have the time. But how did you spend that time and how did you, what was your psyche like in, in, in those moments? Yeah. Well, first of all, we, we were unlike a lot of crashes, and then we had a lot of time to get ready, Shane. We had 45 minutes, actually. You were right, a long time before the time of the explosion and the time we hit down. And the reason was that every time they got on a heading for Sioux City, the plane on its own is sort of veer off to the right, and we have to come back and line up again. I think we did that five times, which took us so long. But I think it was probably, to answer your question, a whole myriad of, of thoughts. Uh, you know, I thought about my wife. I thought about her being a widow. I thought about the fact that I hadn't had kids yet. Um, I, I thought about um, the afterlife. I had two sisters who died at birth that I, I might, that I never met, that I might be able to rendezvous with. Um, and then at the end, I thought, all right, let's make sure at the end, being a couple minutes before we hit, being, um, all right, let's make sure that if you're alive, you're not going to panic. You're not going to flee the plane. You're not going to help yourself. Let's, let's stay calm and help other people. And that thought was my last one before we hit the ground. And I think it kind of paid off. And I think it did for everybody else, too. There, there wasn't any panic at all. Uh, the moment of impact then, um, when the, the plane crash landed into the, uh, I think, into a cornfield or ended up in a cornfield at the airport in, in Sioux City, Iowa, um, and broke into something like four pieces, what, what, what was your... Do you recall that moment on impact? Do you recall the moments thereafter? Yeah, I sure do, Shane. Uh, you know, first of all, a normal DC-10 landing is about 120 miles an hour when you hit the ground. We hit it 255 miles an hour. So we're coming in. We're, we're having airspeed that's twice what it should have been because they couldn't control that plane. And so they knew they were going to crash. We dropped three times faster than we were supposed to. So that impact, to answer your question, was just absolutely incredible. It's like we just dropped out of the sky and hit the ground, which is, I guess, kind of what we did. But immediately inside the cabin, I mean, first couple of seconds after we slammed down, uh, uh, bodies are being thrown about inside the plane. Some were still strapped in their chairs and their chairs had given and people were thrown in their chairs, still strapped, uh, smoke and fire and debris all in the first couple of seconds after we hit down. So uh, it was for all the, the thoughts of what it was going to be like when we hit the ground. I don't think anybody was ready for how hard we hit and how much craziness there was as soon as we hit. Do you remember looking around you and, and I guess specifically the people uh, in, in the seats closest to you, beside you, in front of you, behind you, what condition they were in? Or was it just a case of people were, were, were strewn everywhere? Yeah, you know, we, we were in the uh, brace position. We had practiced that, which for me was to grab the seat back in front of you, put your hands on the top of it, and then cross your arms and hold on that way. And I was doing that, holding on as tight as I, I possibly could. But after we hit the ground, I sort of looked around a little bit and I saw all this all this debris and fire and people being thrown about inside the cabin. I remember thinking to myself, all right, this is maybe after 10 or 15 seconds after we hit the ground, I thought, all right, this is bad. Uh, there are some people that are going to survive this. There are a lot of people are going to be hurt, uh, uh, but maybe we'll coast to a stop and I'll just assess things in. Cause it felt like we hit the ground and we bounced a couple of times, which is what happened. We bounced in our nose and then we started sliding and I thought, all right, we'll just slide to a stop and I'll assess things then. And about the time I had that thought, Shane, we flipped over frontwards. We kind of cartwheeled end to end. The nose dug into the runway, and we flipped over that way. And, uh, and that's where it really got crazy. I mean, I slid upside down and backwards for 
uh, almost a mile off the runway and into a piece of cornfield next to the airport. I, I'd read somewhere that, um, and I know you do, you know, public speaking and, and, and inspirational speaking uh, a lot of places, uh, even to this day. And as a sports fan, uh, you had written that, you know, I had a game plan that in those moments, it was almost that you had focused and, uh, and, uh, and treated those moments of emergency as, as a sports event, almost uh, the most serious sports event of your life, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that did happen. You know, and, and I think that goes back to the fact that we had a lot of time before we hit. Uh, you know, most of these major airline disasters, something happens and immediately there's chaos and there's really no time to think it through. We had time to do that. We had time to get a game plan. And I just remember thinking, all right, uh, like you said, hey, if, if if I'm intact, if I'm alive, I'm going to help people. I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to flee the plane and, and try to save myself first. And 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 most of it was. I right, just get ready to react to the circumstance. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to look like when we when we come to a stop. But what when we do, let's just uh, let's not panic and let's react to the the environment. And I think that paid off for me. It, it it did. I know that it did because my first thought was when we came to a halt finally was all right. Don't don't get out of the plane. Let's help other people because there were a lot of people around me that were in in rough shape. One of those people, um, and some people may be familiar with the story, but uh, Sabrina Michelson was was an 11 month old baby, I think, at the time. And uh, can you tell people a little bit about that story, and and, and I guess that the cries you heard from her, and and, and how you, you reacted to that? Yeah, we, we finally came to halt, and I'm hanging upside down in my chair. Um, we're, we 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 stood up, like I said, upside down backwards for almost a mile, and finally came to a halt and unbuckled my seatbelt and got down to the ceiling now because you're upside down and started moving to the back of the plane with some other people because the smoke was coming from the front to back. I really had no choice but to go back. And all the while, just trying to, trying to get people their feet, the people we thought were alive, and there were a couple other gentlemen that were about my age who weren't hurt seriously like me who were just trying to help. And, and finally, I saw an opening. I saw sunlight coming through this opening in front of me, and I thought I saw people going out that thing. And I thought, that's my way to get out. I'll stand as long as I can and help, and I'll get out there. I'll follow those people. And I did that for, I was in the, in the cabin probably two minutes, two or three minutes initially. And I got outside and I stepped out in the sunlight into a cornfield, like you said, and uh, I heard a baby crying. And I can tell you what I didn't do, Shane. Honestly, I didn't think it through. I didn't weigh the risk. I didn't, th I didn't think if I go back in this plane, it might explode or I might not find my way back out. I certainly didn't think I'm going to go back and find this baby and be some hero. But I, I just I remember turning around, looking at the opening I'd come out of and seeing smoke coming out of it, I just went back in. And it wasn't very far, um, probably 10 or 15 feet back inside the wreckage. And It's quite extraordinary. And, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on the numbers here. I think you were, you were 29 years of age. And I know you were on, on board with, with, with your friend, Jay Ramsdale, who was, who was 25, I think. Um, what are your memories? I'm sure you, you, you were desperate to look for him uh, in the immediate moments after the crash as well. Yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't really think about Jay a whole lot. I just, I, I guess my thought was, you know, he can take care of himself. I'm taking care of myself. We're separated by seven rows in the plane. I'm guessing he went a different direction than I did. I really didn't give him a whole lot of thought until, you know, an hour or two late, maybe an hour or so later when we finally were evacuated from the, the, uh, the cornfield area. Survivors were and started going to hospitals. And then I started thinking about him. But, you know, I, I just, uh, there was so much chaos and so much craziness and, so many people that were hurt and walking over bodies and all that, that I just really didn't think about him. I thought about all the people that were around me in that plane, the people I encountered. So there's, there's no real guilt to the fact that I don't think, I don't think any way that, that I didn't think about him, but I just thought, you know, he'll take care of himself. I'm, I'm sure that the, the following years were, were, were very difficult. And I know a lot of people who have spoken about uh, surviving airplane accidents or even car accidents or, you know, fighting in, in world wars, that survivor's guilt is a, is a very real thing and it, and it hits you very hard. But what was survivor's guilt like for you? Did you experience it? How did you manage it? I did. It hit me hard and I never, I never saw it coming, Shane. I really didn't. I was warned that it might. 
but I kind of brushed that off and because I, I looked in the mirror and thought I should see the luckiest person in the world. I'm in this middle I'm in the middle of a circle of people who died in the crash. I mean the guy on my left died, his wife to his left died, a little boy in front of me, uh, the guy across the aisle, the woman behind me, everybody around me in that crash perished. And I came out without any serious injuries. So I'm thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm the luckiest guy there is. And that's what I wanted to think. And I just couldn't. I, I, for some reason, and I think it's, I'm told anyway, I don't know if this is true or not. It's, some, it's a chemical imbalance in your brain that gets you to think that way with post-trauma stress. And, and I don't know if that's true or not, but um, it, that might explain a lot of things if I have a, a chemical imbalance in my brain. <laughs> some other things, no. Um, but I just, uh, it, it, it hit me. And it's like, especially that little boy sitting in front of me. He, had, he was 18 months old, Shane. He had his whole life in front of him. And I'm 29 years old at the time of the crash. He dies. We're two and a half feet apart. He dies, and I come out with any serious injuries. It just that the guilt of that hit me, and it and it wouldn't let go for a long time. Um, did it? Obviously, fate is is a, a word that comes up a lot when when people look at the seat numbers of people in on an airplane crash that survived and 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 died, and and the luck involved in that. Do you, do you put it down to luck? Do you put it down to fate? Do you put it down to to faith or 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 What's your what's your take on it? Yeah, and mine is this, and, and I and I've gotten to this point since the crash. It wasn't before the crash, but uh, personal belief. I just believe God's got a perfect plan for everybody. And for me, it was to survive that crash. And like I said at the outset of of your interview with me, is I, I think this is one of the reasons I'm I'm doing these kinds of things so I can tell the story and and maybe have some positive influence on somebody. But that's the way I look at it. You know, it was a it was a long time after the crash, a couple of years, where I asked that question every single day. Why did I survive the crash? Why did it, why did I survive? And this little boy in front of me die, and this guy on my left died, and Jay seven rows behind me died. You know, why, why, why? And when I finally came to the point, Shane, where I realized I would never have those answers, it would never make sense. I stopped asking the question so often. And that's when I think I got a lot healthier. It's like, all right, I'm just going to leave this in God's hands and I'm going to let him deal with it. I'm here. I'm happy I survived. I'm going to make the most of it. I'm struck as well by, um, you know, people who, who are inextricably linked to one particular event um, and how they deal with that. I mean, I think behind me, I have a photo of the, the Apollo moon landings here behind me. And I'm sure someone who walked on the moon is, is going to be constantly asked about that one day or one week in their lives for the rest of their life you know someone who wins one super bowl is going to be asked about that for the rest of their lives and similarly for you i guess for all the the other things that you've achieved uh, people are always going to talk about that day do you do do you find that difficult or do you find that something that as you said you you try to teach people your learnings from it not not difficult at all for me i I think for some of the people that i know who survived our crash or survived other disasters i think that is a, a burden for them it's a weight but it has never been that way for me, uh, especially the last you know, 20, 25 years since the crash. So a big majority of that time since that event. So I just look at it this way, Shane, it's, it's a part of my life. It'll never go away. And it, people think about it and they attach it to me every time, almost every time we talk and do interviews like this, which is fine. This is, this is who I am. This is, this is why God put me through this so I can speak to this. So um, I just came to the conclusion that, you know, it's part of my life. It's never going to go away. We'll just deal with it as best we can. And it's, it, it, and at times, uh, the crash and survival of it's turned out to be a great blessing. It, I've had a chance to influence some people, I think, in the right way. Um, I guess in your in your line of work, when you're covering an NBA team or a Major League Baseball team, travel is a necessity. Um, did it take you long, or did you even get back on an airplane after thereafter? I, I mean, July nineteenth, nineteen eighty nine. When was the next time you got on board an airplane? Yeah. This is going to sound a little more courageous than it really was, but uh, I got back on a plane the next day after the crash. So really? July 20th. So, yeah, and it was it was strange because uh, I went to a hospital, got released right away because I wasn't hurt. At least I didn't think I was. And got contacted by United Airlines that night, and they said, hey, we're, we're bringing a plane into Sioux City from Denver, and we're going to take anybody back to Denver that wants to go. Do you want to go? Because you're out of the hospital. And I said, yes, I, I want to go back home. So uh, I stayed up all night looking for Jay, uh, went from hospital to hospital, made all these phone calls and couldn't find him. And by the next day, so I didn't sleep at all that night. Crash happened at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the uh, flight to back to Denver was at four o'clock the next day. So 24 hours later, hadn't slept a bit. So I hadn't slept in two days 
and I was just exhausted. I got to the airport. My brother had driven up from Kansas and he had spent the morning with me and drove me to the airport. And I was just, I, there was no adrenaline left. It was gone. So I got on that plane. I found a seat, fastened my seatbelt. And the next thing that I remember, we're landing in Denver. So I slept through the entire flight. Like, uh, like, like I said in, my, in a book I wrote, I got right back on the horse. Uh, and then I fell asleep in the saddle after I got bucked off. So, and that's probably, Shane, the best way that could have happened. I think if I would have thought about it more and analyzed it and tried to decide whether I wanted to fly again or not, I might have driven myself crazy, but it just happened. I just got back on the plane, fell asleep, and, and never really have had any anxiety about it since that time. You mentioned your book there. Um, for the people who, who want to read it, it's, it's called Chosen to Live. Uh, did, you, did you find that writing process uh, cathartic? Did it help you deal with what you, you had gone through in any way? It, it did. Yeah. It, and that's really why I wrote the book. I, I was approached by some publishing companies after the crash to write a book and I never wanted to do it. And, and I just didn't want to revisit it. I just didn't think there was anything there that, that people didn't already know. I mean, the, the crash was so public. Um, and then I started writing a journal. There was one year with the nuggets on the road where I just started writing it. Somebody encouraged me to do that. And I looked at that, that journal after a season traveling with the nuggets and thought that looks like a book. And, uh, I thought I got a couple messages I like to I like to give to people, so I wrote the book, and it was it was emotional to write it, um, but it was also therapeutic, like you asked. I think the answer to that question is yes. It was good for me to write it, and and uh, it's been out a long time. It's been out uh, 25 plus years. I can't believe it's it's been that long. So yeah, I think that the book was a good thing for me. We're obviously a, a sports channel um, first and foremost here at Off the Ball, but. Uh, I guess traveling with, with teams like the Nuggets and, and the Rockies in, in baseball as well, uh, you must have a lot of experiences and possibly enough to, to fill a book um, in itself. But what are your, your favorite memories from, from being a sports broadcaster over the years? You know, I think with, with the Nuggets, there are a couple of things. Uh, there was a year, uh, the 93-94 season, so my second year doing the team where uh, the Nuggets were the number eight seed in the playoffs and beat the number one seed, uh, which was Seattle at the time. First time a number eight had ever beaten a number one and did it on their court. They had the best record in the NBA that year. And uh, George Carl was their coach, who turns out to be the Nuggets coach later and a good friend of mine. Uh, so that was a great moment. Uh, there was a couple other games that were uh, there were two triple overtime games that the Nuggets won, where a couple players just went off and had 50 points. So um, those were fun. With baseball, there were a couple of a couple of great moments. Uh, we had a player uh, Nolan Arenado, one of the great third basemen in, in the in the game, and a couple of years ago he hit a home run as a walk off winner, and he completed the cycle at the same time, which is really rare. I mean not just to complete the cycle, but to do it with a home run, your last at bat, and to have it uh, win a game for you was unbelievable. And I think that's the greatest moment I had in baseball. But just you know, doing those games, I was 20 years in the NBA and 10 in Major League Baseball was just a, just a blessing. All of it was fun. There was never a day, Shane, where I wasn't excited about going to the arena or the ballpark. Every day was it seemed like a fantasy world for me. You strike me as someone who would – almost certainly have seen uh, The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix. Yeah. So what, what were your thoughts on it? I mean, this, the psyche, a lot of people over here in Ireland watching it, watched it as well, and uh, hugely popular, obviously. Yeah. You know what it did for me? It, it br just brought back memories of, of how fun it was to cover that team. I mean, that was such a dominant organization, and Michael Jordan was probably the most recognizable person in the world, maybe at that point, certainly an athlete, I think. It seemed that to me that way anyway, but just watching that, I just, I, it took me back to, cause I was with the Nuggets that whole time and we play them twice a year and just to, to, to relive how exciting, how fun, how uh, engrossed everybody was in that Michael Jordan thing, because it was a phenomenon chain. It was, if you, if you ever had a, had a chance to go to a game when Michael Jordan was playing in Chicago, it was unbelievable. It was so incredibly loud. Nobody could get a ticket. It was, it was just the place happening in the world. It seemed at that point. So it just brought back memories of how fun that era was for me and, and how it was just a small part of it. It was, I, I thought terrific. And finally, Jerry, I mean, I've seen as well endurance sports is something that you're heavily involved in. I know you've done plenty of triathlons and marathons and, uh, what struck, really struck, struck out for me was the, the race across America and the Colorado crossing as well. So what were those endurance cycles like I'm particularly interested in? 
Yeah, the, the cycling thing is something that, the, that I really have a passion for, really like to do it. And, and that goes back to the plane crash, Shane. I, I, after the crash, it was suggested that I, uh, you know, find some kind of athletic endeavor to kind of fill up the space a little bit. And I, and I got back on a bicycle, and I'd done triathlons early in my life, and, and I got back on a bike and just felt great. This felt like it was therapeutic. And, and so I had this, this love affair that kind of uh, bloomed after the crash with cycling. And so I decided to, to use it to raise money. I, I rode across America a couple times just on my own uh, to raise money for charities. And then in 2015, I did the race across America, like you said, as part of a two-person relay which is a really hard event. It, it's not easy. Uh, it's 3,000 miles. We did it in seven days, so we're averaging over 400 miles a day, and you never stop riding. You, you ride 24-7. We won the two-person division that year. Um, I was actually going to do Ram Race Across America this summer as a solo racer, and it got canceled because of COVID. So I'm going to try to do that in, in 2021. But it's just, a, just something I really enjoy, have a passion for, and to be able to combine that with uh, raising money for for charities is just uh, something I, I love to do well listen for those uh, people watching and listening who uh, want to read more in your story as i mentioned the book is called chosen to live i'm sure you can get it on amazon and all the all the usual places but uh listen jerry shemmel you've been you've been wonderful with your time and uh, really appreciate you taking the call thanks a lot absolutely good to be with you shane thank you for having me